What are the favorite wrestling photographs of your favorite wrestlers? Let's find out. Hello and welcome to the Portrait of a Wrestler YouTube channel. And this is the first of a new series entitled, funnily enough, Portrait of a Wrestler. And joining me today is indie high-flying star of Shikara, Progress, WXW, PWG, Attack with an exclamation mark, TNA, Boot Camp winner, WWE superstar of NXT, 205 Live, and Raw is War. Along with his tag team partner, fellow Welshman, Flash Morgan Webster, he was the NXT UK Tag Team Champion and most recently was Subculture Impact Wrestling Tag Team Champion. This is everyone's favorite skateboarding, pop punk, flip, flippy, punk plucky, underdog babyface, Mark Andrews. How are you, Mark? I'm good, thank you. I'm even better after that intro. That was impressive. That was really impressive how you reeled that off. I need to uh, get you, you know, teaching me my promos. That was awesome. That'd be a good ring entrance, I think, for you. You'd have to have a long yeah. entrance way to do it, though. So this is, we're going to be looking at your uh, three of your favourite photos from not only your career within wrestling, but also outside of wrestling. But we need to start with your first ever promo picture, which we're going to show you now. Talk me through oh. this, Mark Andrews. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Not at the time uh, under Mark Andrews. I was actually the lightning kid. Uh, one of one of many people who've used the name the lightning kid look at that blue and yellow mask lightning bolts on either side you can see a little bit there on my bum on the bum of my tights is a big cloud an angry cloud that was a staple point in the gear back then for the lightning kid so yeah uh, fond memories of those years <laughs> can you remember the lightning kids first match and did you win it i lost my first match and actually my very first match as a lightning kid i didn't have the mask as well but it was 2006 it was actually 17 years ago this month um and this photo was taken i'm gonna say about 15 about 14 or 15 years ago so it, i had a few years of no professional promo photos i'm pretty sure this was the very first one i had once i'd already you know put on the mask I love it. Have you have you still got the mask? So I do have the mask somewhere, but I've, behind me, I've actually got another Lightning Kid mask, which, you know, give me one second. Oh, hold on. Oh, there that? it is. It's got an yeah. angry cloud on it. <laughs> After a while, I decided the angry cloud was such good branding for the Lightning Kid that I added it to another mask as well. But I've still got the original one as well, I think. Uh, but I'm, I have no idea if it was washed after its last use. So I'm not in a hurry um. to find it anytime soon. <laughs> So we, we look at three three of your favorite photographs. This is something I love doing. I love talking about photography and people's favorite photographs because um, uh, different photographs mean different things to people. And as long as a photograph means something to someone, then that makes it a photograph. We're going to start with the favorite photograph that you have from your own career. And it's this one here, which looks like a shameless plug for me, doesn't it? It's dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> it is it's it's one of yours and you know what it's it, I, I, I i i promise you i didn't do this intentionally for this interview it's right up there as well so it's it's here by me in my office it's one of my fit well it's my favorite from my career uh wembley arena against one of my best friends in eddie dennis recreating the famous jeff hardy swanton bomb off of the ladder for a table um and what you can't tell from the photo is that the table didn't break, which was a big problem in the match. However, the photo doesn't show that. So it's just an epic shot, perfect timing, crowd in the background. And I think for me, it just, it sums up loads. It sums up mine and Eddie's journey and our friendship of years and years and years of knowing each other and being in a big marquee match at Wembley Arena. And then the fact that it is Wembley just goes to show like how far we've come and, um, and how far British wrestling has come as well. Um, and then more importantly as well, it's me impersonating one of my childhood heroes in Jeff Hardy. You know, one of the first wrestling match I ever saw was the Hardys against the Dudleys at Royal Rumble. And he does a very similar spot off of the kind of little balcony area. Um, so yeah, it's just, it, it kind of sums up to me making it in wrestling. You know, I, I got to be the person who I watched when I was younger. I remember that Hardys Dudleys one from the Royal Rumble because it got superseded by TLC, didn't it? But it, I thought it was a better match at the time. Yeah. Like, in terms of like the story, in the storytelling of getting the Hardys to the point where they could be on TLC and be main eventers, right? I agree, actually. Yeah, because I, I, I love the TLC matches as well. You know, the, the triple threat ladder match and, and the TLC one, two and three. But the, the tables match is, is so good. It's really, really good. Um, loads of creative spots in there. And yeah, you're right. You know, it kind of it's those matches which got us to TLC and got us to the ladder match. So yeah, it's uh, it was a great first match for me to introduce me to wrestling. And it's obviously led me 
then I guess 14 years on to want to impersonate that kind of stuff here in Wembley Arena. So I remember when Progress first booked Wembley Arena and, and obviously super strong style and everyone was excited, but you're still kind of like questioning, can, can an independent British promotion get a big crowd? To, to, to fill sort of Wembley Arena and credit to them they did I think it was 5,000 plus in the end in front of 5,000 fans there surrounding you as you're on top of that led uh, on top of that ladder looking down what's going through your head honestly and this is something which which uh, guys I've done this a few times now throughout my career and every time and you wouldn't imagine that this is what's going through my head every time I'm up there I'm just saying please don't miss <laughs> Because imagine how bad it would be to like you rarely see people jump off ladders and go through tables and miss, but it's actually quite hard to get like to accurately drop your body onto this like you know thin little bit of wood. So uh, you know, luckily I didn't miss. I mean, the table didn't break in the way we hoped it would, but mm. I definitely hit him. So uh, <laughs> lucky for me, Eddie Dennis is a big guy, and he could you know <laughs> it wasn't as painful for me as I'm sure it was for him. He can take it. He's fine. I'll tell you what, I rushed backstage as well. And I was interested in getting as much backstage stuff as I could, which I haven't. I still haven't released most of it to this day because I never wanted to release it too close, if that makes sense. Although, yeah, I'd love to days, see that. The big, well, the big companies send it all out now anyway. But I remember rushing backstage after that match because I knew I knew how much it meant to you and Eddie. And I knew how much it meant to... I knew how much effort Eddie had put into the story leading up to it. Because this is a story that had run for quite some time. And then I ran backstage and I thought, I'll be able to get something of you two together. And he was... I could probably say this now. He was fuming after this match. You were, you took a bit of time to come through. So I saw him just... Like, literally, as he come through, he threw that contract threw it right across the floor, stormed backstage. Everyone's going around him going, no, it was good, it was good, it was good, don't worry about it. And he was just like, I remember him just saying, a year, a year of my life. But there were little things that, that happened in the match, which are things that actually I, I that endear me to wrestling matches. I love things when they're imperfect because I think yeah. that that makes it brilliant. You know, I think that gives it the, re the edge of reality that makes it believable, you know, but... Um, yeah, I remember having, a lot of people having to calm him down after the match. Yeah, I, I think uh, and looking back now, years later, I think we would both agree that those kind of, uh, you know, those tables not breaking and bits going wrong, like, can add to it. At the time, it just it stung, you know, really stung because it just felt like, ah, oh. you know, and luckily we got the final table. In a way, you know, it was, mm. it worked. It, it, some would say perfectly that none of them broke until the final one. But it, yeah, it definitely just felt like, um, you know, also, I guess, for, like, on that show, the actual main event, which was uh, Tyler versus Walter, that mm. wasn't the initially planned main event. So you'd have people drop out. I believe it was, like, Zack Sabre and Osprey. So to us, in some ways, we kind of felt like the main event because we'd had, a, like, a year or a year and a half storyline building to this moment, like, almost dragging it out all the way until Wembley. So I think mm. that's what put the pressure on our shoulders as well. Um, but now I look back at it so fondly because... Yes. I mean, you know, and these photos, you know, every time I look at them, I feel I feel so proud of what we did achieve, not just necessarily in the match, but that entire time, the year in build to it, the, the whole build to Wembley. Um, so, yeah, one of my proudest moments of my career was that storyline and, 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 you know, finishing it in Wembley. Right. Image number two, we ask you to provide you with an image from wrestling, your favorite image from wrestling that doesn't involve you. Um, and you have chosen this one. Yeah. And there's a few from this from this match, and I had to kind of pick from. And I think this is the one which is my favorite. Because, to me, this shows what a spectacle professional wrestling can be. And as I said previously, you know, my, the first match I ever saw was, um, you know, Tag Team Tables match at Royal Rumble. And I quickly was, like, thrown into the Attitude Era. So it was hardcore matches, table matches, ladder matches, Hell in a Cell matches. And I just remember as a kid being obsessed with this match from King of the Ring 1998. You know, I'd go back and watch it on VHS all the time. Because I remember just thinking, it doesn't get better than this. Surely this is like the best match of all time, you know? Because I've, I'd never seen a spectacle like this. The, the fall from the Hell in the Cell, the fall through the Hell in the Cell, the bumps onto the thumbtacks, all of it like the storytelling throughout it and you know some might look at it now like back just as some crazy car crash match but to me as like a nine-year-old kid you know going back and watching this i remember thinking this is this is it this is what defines wrestling to me and i think you know he starts the match on top of the cell and this photo where you see the crowd behind so high up in the tiered seats 
and he is the same, you know, Mick Foley is the same height as like the 20th row back or whatever it is. And it's just like, imagine being there, you know, imagine being there, knowing how high you are compared to the ground seats. I'm looking ahead and seeing a man the same height as you. And this photo just kind of encapsulates it all, in my opinion. You know, it's just, you can see how rowdy the crowd is, how excited they are, how close to the cage that they are as well, that front row. And to me, it just seems like, I don't know, you could show this photo to a non-wrestling fan. And at first they just think, what the hell is going on? Like, what is, I need to know more. You know, I need to know what is going on. Is, is that a wrestling ring or a boxing ring? Or why is there a cage? Why is he wearing a tie? You know, like, is it a mask he's wearing? Like, who are all these people? Like, it's just, it, there's so much intrigue from this photo. Um, and yeah, I just kind of think it sums up the match perfectly as well. Like the actual spectacle of what a Hell in a Cell match is and what pro wrestling should be. Obviously, there's lots of context and lots of photographs that showcase the the high spots in this match. And, and they're some of the most replayed spots, you know, in, in wrestling history. It's interesting you note the tie for, for a non-wrestling fan to look at this guy with a chair, a mask, brown pants, this sort of ripped shirt, but a tie. And you forget how much of a story arc Mankind's character had got to get to this point. But the only previous Hell in a Cell match within WWE before this one was Michael's Undertaker, where they did yeah. eventually get to the top of the cell, didn't they? So so they, they did the whole, they went in and around, got out, went over the top, fell off, and then came back in and had yeah. the big ending. So like this kind of felt like it took everyone by surprise because I think everyone was expecting oh, at some point they'll get up there. But to actually raise the stakes and go, and I remember JR's commentary was really synonymous with this at the time. Undertaker says, he's doing it! You want me up there? You want to come up there and fight? I'm going to come up and whip your butt. Oh my. And Undertaker starts climbing the cell and there's that yeah. real sense of anticipation. But I think in terms of, like you say, the whole spectacle, this, like, looking back at this photo now, this the, the ruggedness of the fans around the ring and how close they are and the barriers feels like what 80s and 70s wrestling felt like when we were younger looking back at those does that make sense yeah. compared to the modern yeah. day product in wrestling it's funny because like we always talk about suspending disbelief right and I, I always say it's not about making someone think that it's real it's about making them forget that it's fake now in this match you are forgetting that it's fake because it parts of it are not you know and i just i think in wrestling as well we have this we have this trend um in the wrestling business to try and get as much length from something as possible so for example someone could argue that maybe you know you shouldn't have started the match on the cage and done all these crazy big stunts because this is only the second match ever and you could have taken 20 years of hell in the cell to tell that story however i actually think in the contrary and i i can only assume that mick foley might have wanted this as well Actually, instead of milking something through match and match and match, doing a bit more, bit more, bit more, he's created a moment that will last forever. And that, to mm. me, means so much more than slowly telling a story over time. No one will ever top this. We will always go back and watch this match and just, like, look at this imagery. You know, this just... I mean, look at, like, the, the crowd. I don't think the match has even begun at this point. And the right. crowd are going crazy for the moment that he climbs up the top of the cell at the start of the match. I mean, that's just, yeah, that's magic yeah. to me. That's that's what I love that's about funny. pro wrestling right there. Which of the which of the two bumps are you taking? Are you taking the table bump or the one through the cage? Which one would you rather take? You know, when I was a kid, I dreamed of taking both. And as I've gotten older and I've climbed those ladders, I've realized they are higher than they look. These are big boys. He is like six foot four or something, you know? Yeah. Um, I think I'd probably have to fall off the, off of it. I don't think I'm heavy enough to go through it. <laughs> it's insane, insane. It's a great shot and it's a wonderful selection. And it was in my last video, I, I looked at some of a fan's favorite photographs uh, throughout wrestling. And there are at least three that came up from this match from different angles, from above and from below. And it's just so dramatic. It's such a moment in history. So, yeah, that's a wonderful choice. Thank you. This one didn't come up, so I'm glad that you chose this one. Going on to your last photograph, we ask you to pick any photograph from anywhere that means something to you. It can be from inside of wrestling or from outside of wrestling. And you've chosen family, which I really love. Talk to me about this. So uh, I love this photo. It was only from maybe 
want to say five months ago, actually. So it's me and my wife, Sarah, and our beautiful daughter, Bella, um, who at the time, I guess, was five or six months old. Uh, and it's in the field, the sunflower field, that we got married in a year before. So this was like a year after like our anniversary um, in the same place in Clearwell Farm where we got married. And uh, it's just, it's really lovely for me because I think it kind of sums up the, well, the year that we had, really. So two weeks before we got married last year, uh, I got released from WWE. We just moved into our new house. We would found out that Sarah was pregnant. So it was just everything was going on. You know, a house move, pregnancy, a wedding and getting fired was just so much all in one go. Uh, and then, you know, there's been so m there was so much change in our life all in that time. And then we made it through pregnancy, through the birth, through the you know early months of, of parenting. And it was just really nice to go back to, well, the location of our happiest day of our lives with our little daughter and almost going to be proud of the last year of making it through you know stuff you know with my career as i said after being released and making things work um getting through the kind of early stages of the, the very early stages of parenting um and just yeah going back to the beautiful beautiful sunflower field which we we, we love and we, we visit all the time you know every every halloween for picking pumpkins and every christmas for picking christmas trees and stuff so yeah it's just it's one of our favorite places and it's my two favorite people um and it just yeah it sums up a life that i'm very very grateful to have and i feel very fortunate and very lucky to have the, the way that you describe it is interesting because it sounds like the worst possible time to sort of find out that your wife's pregnant and that you have to you know and that you have to adapt your life completely differently fiscally responsibly for all those reasons and i remember being told when um when we first fell pregnant um as my father-in-law said there's don't if, if now is not a good time when would be like there's never a perfect time but you just exactly, have to adapt yeah. with it and you just have to move with it and that's what makes you a family i think exactly 100 percent. and i guess you know i remember thinking at the time um so i think i think the order went you know we were, we were waiting for our house to go through we were planning our wedding and then we fell pregnant and we were so we were like overwhelmed that like like we were beaming about it and, and the last of, of all of those big things was me getting released and i remember thinking actually it kind of eases the blow because although you know anyone would be financially worried after losing their job with all that stuff going on i was kind of thinking well one out of four isn't bad, you know what I mean? Like, I can't complain right now. Like three amazing things have happened to me in my life. Like we've just moved into our dream house, you know, we're having a kid uh, and, and we've just got married. So really I'll take getting fired. You know what I mean? Being fired is like, you know, it might like suck for a bit, but I can't complain. Like like more good is here than bad. So um, yeah. so yeah, I, I just feel very grateful that those positive things were there to outweigh, you know, a low moment in my life. That's a really lovely way of looking at it. More good than bad. That's really cool. Exactly, yeah. So, Mark, 2024, what have you got planned? One thing I will tell you that we've got planned uh, is some new music with my band, Junior. Uh, last year, we kind of, uh, well, we had a, a quieter year because um, both myself and uh, our drummer, Sai, have both become fathers in that time. But it's our 10-year anniversary this year, so we're releasing some new music soon. We're playing some gigs. Really excited for that. Um, on top of that, then, Attack Pro Wrestling, uh, 2024 is going to be a big year for Attack Pro. Uh, I brought it back last year at the start of 2023. That was kind of our, like, catch-up year to get things back on track. I want to make things even bigger, even better. Big WrestleMania shows this year in April. Uh, excited for those and just to that, for that to keep progressing and growing. In terms of my career, let's see. Let's see where we where we end up. Because last year, you know, we managed to get the, the Impact Wrestling Tag Team Championships. 2024 it's got it my, my, my rule has always been to try and top the years as they go along to keep trying to one-up yourself so what's going to top us winning the impact wrestling and rev pro tag team championships that's cool mark thanks very much for joining us thank you so much for having me james